Okay, okay thanks for the chance to speak to you all, and um, all credit to you for um, all the energy that's gone into the forest that you have here now, and really ready to harvest. It's really uh, great to see, and, and um, also to the team that's done all the hard work, making sure they're in good shape, and are now ready to uh, have profit extracted from them. So my topic is our forest study is a bit of terminology and data, and here what I've tried to do is wrap this talk around, around the logic of um, extracting value from forests, and so all the considerations that you're going to need to make for yourselves about how to do that, hopefully um, this just helps you to be better informed about the steps that you'll go through. So the factors for best harvest returns, they cover a lot of disciplines within that harvesting um, phase of, of your forest ownership. And I'm going to talk about the principles of what value recovery is, some portions about the risks and value leaks, where, where value can be lost, and it's just some encouragement about um, the process and just building the cult, the kind of culture around your harvest process that's going to ensure that you do best. So I went to the dictionary just to make sure I wasn't leading anyone astray about what optimising means, but it's about making the best of a resource for a situation. So that word's used quite a lot in the value recovery sphere. So it touches on all disciplines, from the planning of your harvest, right through to the, um, the actual manufacture of logs, and then the merchandising and sales, how you um, a portion your forest log rates across the available markets and, and do best from, from the calculations that go into that. And it requires deliberate and daily effort. So we set our plans in place to do this, but we've got hundreds of people in the forest and they need each to be um, informed and trained and, and kept in the picture about what's important and then measured and monitored as well. So broadly speaking, the forest Value recovery is about um, prices, costs, and your volume and grade mix, the uh, grades of logs that are the potential in your forest. And it's about the economics, logic, and the people who are going to do the work for you. And so all of this drives what's left for you as your profit. So I tried to represent this as a cycle. Obviously, you're in the planning stage now. The data gathering stage is about what's in our forest, what's living there, what's the potential of it, and then matching that to the market. So you're going to catch your data about what the markets require, what they're likely to be able to consume, and what their priorities and preferences will be, and how much they can pay you and whether they're going to be reliable in doing that. And then you're integrating all of that and applying your intelligence to come up with optimal actions day by day to make sure that, um, that you do best. Volume of log grade mix. So that's about the quantities and the attributes of what's in your forest. So there's ways of assessing that that can be quite accurate. But our subject to um, needing to be watched in terms of that data capture process is quite subjective. Then you use that data to establish what your sales program is going to be. And then you can model that data as well, and you can look forward and grow that data forward and look at what you're going to have at times in the future and how that grade mix and volume is going to change and that can help you in your decision making. The customers have plans too. They need to know what log grades are coming in their, um, in their wood catchment of interest and the likelihood that they're able to bring that into their sales program. So, so your data is useful to your customers as well. Well, so the big summarising our uh, feature with harvesting costs is that the best people will have options so they um, not only within the harvesting game, they may go and work from one crew to another and change forest owners depending on the conditions that are offered and how they're treated. There's a lot of demand for the skills that people have when they work in the forest and that can cross industries as well. So someone who's good, good with machinery can work in Perth in the mines or on the uh, and Hogan on the roads here. So um, there is interchange of these skills. And a, and a big thing is that when the, when the price is hot in the market, that's not the time to be trying to uh, hire people, whether for management or to work in the hardest crews. There's no time to buy talent.
And yeah, yeah check, check logging I found to be problem logging. logging. We'll go into a bit more detail around that. So, so 2000, I was um, unfortunate to hire a logging crew that came from medieval times. <laughs> and they had they presented a lovely offer of $18 a tonne to do quite long road line salvage, which is to extract the timber from alongside a road line corridor before that road's built. And it all looked great at the time. So we engaged them. And that's when the trouble started, and I started losing sleep. All for um, 70 people that just, just were um, not really up to what we needed them to do. We had um, quite quickly had a call from a local push and speaker, just about that big. And he um, yeah, started getting on the hammer about these guys that like them. I said, we'll start working with them and we'll make sure they come up to the mark. And about two weeks later, one of them tried to cut another one's arm off on the skid. Just down. Yeah, very problematic. <laughs> No productivity, we're expecting 200 that, tons a day out of them. We're also expecting certain progress along this first road line corridor and um, being able to build roads so that we can get in there for water and, and do the good stuff. And so we're quickly getting behind with that, getting behind with our sales. No fun at all. So I found that this um, seemingly low harvest rate that we were enjoying turned out to be high risk and high cost. And high cost to the contractor as well. We started selling. Um, Stock trucks that he owned to try and pay his bills because it wasn't working for him in the forest either, so no one was happy. And the days of using rough and ready crews like this, they just take on the uh, health and safety environment and all of the challenges that we've had at Harvest that's really a changing world. We're all about now. <coughs> Prices, it's easy to get excited about this, this part. It comes down to who wants logs, what the specs are for what they require. Yeah, their end uses are and how your attributes of the logs will match what, what they need. We talk about on truck pricing. The price at the mill is only one thing. The distance to the mill and the trucking that's required to get it there, that leaves you with your on truck price and that's really what's relevant in, in terms of comparing options. Market breadth is gold. So having a range of options that allow you to Merchandise your material into its most valuable um, homes and get the best returns requires that you're able to sell quite a range of different log grades with different attributes. Generally speaking, your straightest, biggest, roundest logs with an absence of branches being your proved ones are more valuable. And then as things get larger branches, less straight and smaller diameter, you go down that value curve. Things, things can fall down, down the value chain, chain, but they don't go up. So your prune log, that can be sold as a pop log. Your pop log can't be sold as a prune log. <coughs> you need to plan for best market access. Your customers will have a given appetite for a particular log grade. If that's a high value log grade, you need to make sure that you're in there and able to sell it. And that's where planning and informing them about what's coming is really important. And it is the dollar that you keep that counts rather than the price. Now, the key ingredient, ingredient being successful here, I call it the care factor. And it's made out of commitment, attitude, ruthless professionalism that's really standing in the gap and making sure that things are delivered on the day and, and um, done in the, in the agreed way. And that's an hour to hour thing that needs vigilance. And then your enthusiasm about your investment, that's going to drive what happens with your management team and how, how that whole process is performed. Your level of care is going to set the tone how things go. <coughs> and best returns from your forest are going to require consistent attention to these factors. So just a question to take home as you really get stuck into the harvest process. Is your system going to be more like Dad and Dave's home kill? Arriving at the farm to pick up something with a hive and um, and uh, <laughs> drive into a deep freeze, or are you going to get high tech and, and really make sure that you're isolating piece by piece the best value out of the forest and really um, going to work on that? So, the slippery slope of value loss, if we talk about 100% of potential value that stands in your forest, that's the actual log grades that are available to be cut from there, we start to look at the ways that you start missing out on that value. And there are a number of them. 
I've no, summarised it here. I'm not sure if this presentation is going to be available later. Is that perhaps it is? So you can um, study the detail if you like for yourselves. But um, yeah, these things, these chapters, I'm reflecting as we go. The point is, from your 100 percent, it's available in the forest. The only way is down. So, uh, so each era or uh, lack of planning or lack of integrity around what happens in the harvest process just takes you away from that 100 percent of potential volume and value. So turning the ground, basically that's addressing each of these areas that's, that's limiting or is a risk to the process of extracting that maximum value. So at the bottom you're starting with having a sound plan for how you're going to execute your harvest operations and extract maximum value, have a, have a written plan, and, and to be reviewing that and just keeping working on the process of extracting all that you can from the process. For the culture of care, it's excellent training, training. being fair about your purpose, purpose. So, so making sure, sure that people are trained into the um, best methodology for extracting value, but also that, 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 that they're understanding it as you thought they did. Often there's misinterpretations and things need to be continually communicated. So importance and the detail around how things are done. Require daily focus. And that way you can work towards that, that optimal outcome. Relationships, this is where it all gets a bit wishy-washy, doesn't it? Um, but really, I uh, summarise it as um, trust and care for each other's business. So the contractors that are out there, they go out on a limb with um, big, big debt usually to buy equipment. They need to keep that operating. They need to be able to retain workers. Likewise, for you guys to have continuity and um, supplying all your customers requires that you have sound relationships with, with these guys. Costs that you will pay and the prices that you receive will come down to the quality of your relationships. Broadly speaking, export drives prices in the long market, domestic mills offer stability. And so, just a, a bit of a takeaway here is that, that you will need to invest to ensure that you get best service and that you're able to extract, extract best value from your forest. Ups and downs, we'll see this in the paper. Bob prices are anything but stable. Again, domestic sawmills are there when export stops generally. So that's your point of stability. To keep an infrastructure, you need to have good balance into your domestic markets as well. The domestic sawmills won't always meet an overheated export market price for logs. But your program covers many years. And trust me, if you're in an export only style of um, marketing, it's very tough out there as a me to uh, me to exporter of logs. There's many people trying to uh, market undifferentiated products often when there's very little demand. It's very tough. The exciting highs, it's always great to read about um, record log pricing and let's get into it. But everyone wants to get in there at the same time. And, and they're only a part of life when you're harvesting a forest. Maximum return needs us to have a, a big picture and a long term perspective on what's happening out there. Interesting, capitalising on short term highs, a few tricks for that. Good planning, sales and marketing. You need to have roads into forests. It can take 12 to 24 months to get roading infrastructure through. You can't harvest what you can't get the truck to. Relationships. You need to you're going, going to need to accept that you need to weather some storms to keep infrastructure and markets open. Highs only last for months out of your harvest years, so for the many years you're going to be logging, you're going to experience some peaky highs probably, and the rest of the time you're going to have to be making judgments around how you pay for seed when it's less exciting. Interesting the factors for success and capitalising on short term highs, many of them are the same as for long term success. This fellow a quick tail of two logs, two theoretical um, trees, separate forests, both pruned to 5.8 metres or high, two separate crews with different conditions on them. Got clockwork logging, 
Uh, it was a sell of five and a half metre print logs and some volume to a local mill at $150 a tonne. I've got a good reputation for delivering on time and full inspect. That's why they've got access to this market. Their skills and the crew are really uh, are a high level. The stumps are low. There's least waste from that big valuable prune log. The girl who's falling these trees got a lot of pride in her work. She's doing it well every time. So the trees are laying down. They're easy to extract. There's very little damage when those machines, uh, machinery are extracting those logs. And, and so, so the result is that, that they've got an accurately cut five and a half metre log for sale. Dress log in the back, they're struggling, they've had down seven weeks off. The rate, the rate that they have required this time, they know they're not going to survive for any less, is two dollars a tonne higher than for the other crew. Export's their only option, they've washed away all their domestic options. And the longest spring length available for export is 5.2 metres. Very few skilled workers in the crew, they start by um, leaving a, a high stump, leaving some of that prune log on the stump and tearing the side of the log, like you can see in this, um, in this picture here. The most valuable logs just been torn. I've got a new worker on the skid, he cuts the large end at an angle. And he does the same thing at the small end. So this log is aiming to be 5.2 metres long, it's now 5.13, so it's no good to anyone, it's too short and it can't go into the market that it's intended for. So we're into plan B now, that's to recut this prune log, beautiful big prune log, to 3.7 metres, that's the next option for export prune. Is it correct this time? Maybe not. So you can see this um, image in the bottom corner there. I thought this was fellow last Wednesday. These are probably the biggest prune logs I've seen in the last six months. The massive, there's uh, four pieces on each side of the trailer. And those are two and a quarter tonne each on average. And they've been angle cut. And so that says a lot of, a lot of things. There's, um, there's a guy there whose skills aren't up to the job of cutting that at, uh, perpendicular to the, um, to the log. There's also someone who's allowing that to continue. There's several pieces in this boat. And there's a local driver who's not noticing, not saying anything. Someone, Someone supervising these guys, do they know that this is happening? And so these logs are off somewhere potentially under, under length, but certainly having um, been exposed to risk of, of, of some loss. So for that 3.7 metre log, it's only $130, it's not $150 a tonne like the other one. Port's 10 kilometres further away, so there's $2 more cartridge. And 1.4 <laughs> metres is left in the forest that's just been docked off and pushed over the side. That prune grip is not stuck to sale, it's gone, too short to sell. And some was left on the stump as well. So, sorry about maths, but um, the first log's a tonne in weight. And given $50 worth of logging, cartage, engineering and overhead costs, there's $100 left for the forest owner after that log's um, harvested and delivered. The recut log has lost 200 kilos of its weight, and because the price is $130, it's um, net of 104, or gross of 104 minus $43 of cost. So that's a per ton translation of that same logging cost, but with $2 more cartridge and $2 more on the, on the harvest rate. So when you look at the, at the numbers, it sort of looks like you know, 80% going on. When you look at 80% oh, of the weight still there, 80% of the price doesn't look too bad, but when you multiply things through, that leaves $61 for the forest owner. And that's quite a simple error to make. And here we go again, if they repeat the error, and that log needs to be recut again, and this is not unheard of, this does happen. The next stop is a 3.1 metre KI log at 90 bucks, and you can see the cut flashing again, that leaves $25 for the forest owner. This is $100 for, um, for scenario A, if you like. So 40% 40, 40 loss turns into 75% loss just by the same area getting repeated and just things being a bit shabby on site. So this is just a poster I came up with yesterday and added this to the presentation. Who owns a log from stump to mill? And I'm talking about ownership in the sense of who's taking care of it. So again, I went to the dictionary. So uh, definition one is the state or fact of being an owner. <coughs> so that's the, um, the legal owner of that log in the cells until it's delivered at the mill. 
<laughs> then uh, another aspect of ownership is immediate and direct physical control over that property. And in your operations, you're going to have people engaged who are going to take care of these complex daily tasks to process your logs hours for sale. And these are logs that basically you're not going to see yourselves in general. And there's many people in this chain, and each of them has a chance to uh, do well for you or do better for you. So the quality, again, of the responsibility that they feel for this to happen well, that's... Um, you want that to happen in a way that you're going to prefer. And I'd suggest just, um, I've spent a lot of time in and around the industry, I'm a forest owner as well, I've got some of concerns to you about doing best out of a forest assessment. And what I'm seeing is that um, the quality of relationships out there in this, in this industry, that they require some work, and, and for you guys to do best, that's definitely where you want to put some attention. So this is a logging log log crew um, in a FMNZ harvest operation. Professionalism, it's as vital in the forest industry as it is in any surgery or office. And I say this from the perspective of, of um, if someone's training in medicine, they'll do five to seven years of training and then they'll be under supervised internship while they learn to do surgery better, it's a life and death thing. And there's a lot of time and effort put into making sure that that's done well. And I'd suggest that um, forest harvesting is a life and death thing as well. You need to get used to the idea that this training and inter internship and developing skills needs to be done very deliberately. So I did a quick tally up list of the people I knew and a, and a couple of guesses for the ones I didn't. There's 100 years of experience in this logging crew and it's, um, it's a crew that's operating well and it requires a level of training and experience that's quite high. In the 26,000 hectares in, in your shared estate, that's going to take around 2,500 years of human time just in the logging aspect. That's not counting trucking management, stevedoring, shiploading and all of that. That's just loggers. So the scale of what you're undertaking is quite, quite dramatic. <coughs> So, so for optimal forest value recovery, I tried to get this down to a couple of slides just to summarise what my views are, and I'm, I'm totally open to challenge. I think there's um, you know, obviously there's considerations around the way you want to do things that might impact on what I've said, but I'm, I'm prepared to handle questions. But um, to summarise, you need to value and encourage people, because you want them to value your forest and the process and extracting value. You've got to send us the right signals and align signals about that. I suggest that you educate yourself about forest value recovery. And I say that it's better than tomorrow's lot of numbers. Anyone's going to wonder why that would be? Well, no one can give them to you. But you can give yourself this and really learn to understand the best way forward. And have a plan and a system. Signal your priorities, what's important to you, and keep signaling that. And, and make this your special advantage. There's lots of people out there harvesting forests, and the processes they use are quite a grey box, really. You know, all of the steps that we're talking about, they get lost in uh, daily distractions and production pressure, and, and um, it's very really easy just to become a me too in that process and not have a point of difference. That makes it an opportunity. If you focus on doing well in this sense and those little extras and little extra pieces of margin that might be missed by someone else, you can gain. You're going to need a uh, quality crew uh, at all levels, and you need to hang on to them. So you need to match a long-term view with, with quality daily action, and you need to build this culture of care and professionalism so that people are taking daily steps of the, in the operations that you can't be watching all the time, but they're taking care because they are professional. And value continuity, and this is around yeah, and once you commit to your start, really, really treating it uh, as something valuable to just keep, keep, keep things moving, keep people engaged and employed. If you're able to stand out for this, that's how you get to keep the best markets and you'll attract the best workers. Continuity is really important in terms of financing machinery, but also just putting bread on the table and, the, and people, if they're being cared for in this way, then um, yeah, there's a lot that will come back to you from that.
And that way, when you're when you're at the um, end of your harvest and you're thanking people, you don't need to feel odd or wondering whether you could have done better because you will have done your due diligence yourself, and you will have made sure that it's gone well, just like you planned for it to go.